Good afternoon, everyone. Um, our topic today is enhanced recovery after surgery, also known as ERAS. I'm Dr. Mbungu, my supervisor, Dr. Fike Chani. So the agenda, I'll first define it and give a little bit of background, and I will discuss each individual component, and then I'll conclude. Uh, so ERAS is also known as fast track, or rapid or accelerated um, recovery. It is defined as a model of K for elective surgery, uh, combining elements of K to form a pathway which reduces the physiological stress response and organ dysfunction and um, uh, due to surgery. This enables patients to recover more quicker. So with the background, um, it was initiated by Professor Henry Ketlet in Denmark in the 1990s for colorectal patients. This was after he identified the main factors um, which delay post-operation um, recovery, which is a pain, um, which is pain, gut dysfunction, and immobilization. And um, his aim was to reduce the. Sorry, his aim was to reduce the. Okay, I know it's not, sorry. So his aim was to reduce the physical and psychological impact of major elective surgery on the patient. But Just to give you one second. Um, could you, there is a red pair of salt in it, which none of us would follow. Yeah. And that any aren't here at the moment. Mm. Um, so um, what I've said to them is that if we, this is a short session, we'll go there if that's before four, then we'll go after our session. If you anticipate that this is going to be a longer session, I don't, I don't think it will be more than 30 minutes. I think we'll, we'll manage both to finish yes. So let's try and finish at 5 to 4 if we can. Okay. Because they weren't comfortable with that, but I pushed them to say. Okay. So as I said, um, it was initiated by Professor um, Henry Ketlet in Denmark in the 1990s for colorectal patients. So this was after he identified the three main factors that delay post-operative um, recovery. And the factors are pain, gut dysfunction, and immobilization. So the aim was to reduce the physical and psychological impact of major elective surgery on the patient. Uh, also to facilitate a more rapid recovery and um, shorten length of stay and return to normal activity. Um, so as the Fikichan has said, most of the evidence has been published for colorectal surgical pathway. Um, there, there was a meta-analysis of six randomized controlled trial done by Faradun. Um, they, were, they had 452 patients. Basically, they were comparing the conventional, the conventional um, perioperative path and the one that we use compared to errors. Um, so they were looking at the length of stay and complication rates as well. So as you can see, um, the, the ARIS group had reduced length of stay um, as compared to the conventional one and um, also reduced complication rates in the ARIS group. So how does ARIS differ from uh, the traditional surgical practice? Basically, um, ARIS has shifted away from long inpatient stay and also bowel rest um, uh, for the gastrointestinal and also patients having a restricted role in their care. Instead, patients now are becoming more involved in their care, leaving hospital sooner and recover quicker. And the surgical technique, it favors um, laparoscopy and also moving away from laparotomy to minimal access surgery. Okay. So as you can see, this is a traditional surgical practice, patient being starved and also cold as well. So this is the ARS pathway, patients are well prepared and are well hydrated and they're warm. Okay, now I'll discuss all the components of ARS. It is divided into pre-operative, perioperative and post-operative in outcome. So I will discuss each um, component. So we'll start with preoperative component. As you can see, the, um, the surgeon discussing the procedure with the nurse. 
Okay, the first important one is a pre-operative counseling training. Um, so formal pre-operative risk assessment of the patient's health and fitness for a surgical procedure um, uh, should be timed to allow optimization of any problems identified. This may reduce complications and mortality intra- and post-operatively. So this process should start in the community uh, prior to referral. So they need to identify all the risk factors and try to address them. And then it continues a pre-admission and may require specialist input from anesthetics or medical specialists. Comprehensive verbal and written patient information ensures patients understand the pathway they will follow and the age of role um, they play in the ICAM. Pre-operative um, patient education has been shown in many studies that it may actually reduce um, the need for pain relief and um, also allay anxiety and um, improve patient satisfaction as well. And procedure-specific information and consent is very important. This can be in the form of a pamphlet in the language that the patient understands, um, and it also improves anxiety. And the patient they should actually be given an opportunity to discuss the operation and pain control. Yeah. And then the second point under preoperative is fasting and preoperative carbohydrates loading. It is recommended for patients to fast six hours to solids, but they should be allowed to drink small amounts of clear fluids for up to two hours before um, general anesthesia. Um, most studies have shown that a short period of three hours of fasting after clear fluids is safe and more acceptable to patients as it minimizes patients' thirst and also improves uh, post-operative well-being. And a clear carbohydrate-rich drink should be administered early the night before surgery and three hours uh, prior to induction of anesthesia. Um, there was a randomized control trial done by Noblet. They had about uh, 36 patients. They divided them into fasted group, the preoperative, and the other group was the maltodextrin, which is the carbohydrate drink. So they were looking at post-operative hospital stay and return of gut dysfunction. So um, as you can see, those three graphs, um, there's time until uh, for surgical discharge, and then the one on top is time to first flatus, and then the, th uh, the third one at the bottom is the time to first bowel movement. Um, if you look at the carburetors group, they all um, left the hospital early as compared to the other groups, and also the time of gut dysfunction was actually earlier in the group. So they recommended that a preoperative carbohydrates uh, loading is associated with a short hospital stay and also um, with earlier return to gut dysfunction. To gut dysfunction. Um, and the third point is avoidance of mechanical bowel um, preparation. There was a multi-center randomized trial um, done for colorectal patients. So they had about 1,431 patients and they were divided into two, um, the mechanical um, preparation or not. So um, with a group that had mechanical bowel preparation, they found to have more abscesses after anastomic leakage. And there was, this was explained as the mechanical bowel obstruction, basically it liquefies the, 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 the solid feces, and then during intra-op, it can actually cause the spillage of the contaminant. So that's why there were more abscesses in the group. And, um, and also, it has been shown in the literature that it can cause some serious adverse events, such as fluid, electrolyte imbalance, and it's very um, uncomfortable to patients as well. That's when they, they give the bowel prep, um, the, what do we use? The pharmacological product. Yes. They, in surgery, they use the enemas the night before. And then um, the fourth point under preoperative is um, DVT prophylaxis. As you all know, before surgery, um, 
we use the graduated compression tromboembolic deterrent stockings and then intra-op it is recommended as um, we already know we use the pneumatic mechanical compression and they also advise after operation we must continue with, uh, with the Klexin for at least a month in patients that are at risk of thrombosis, patients such as um, um, residual malignancy and previous episodes of thrombosis. There was um, a double blinded study done in the New England um, Journal. So basically all the patients that had abdominal and pelvic cancer um, surgery, they were given um, the enoxaparin for six to 10 days. And then after that, they were randomly assigned. Uh, there was a placebo group and the enoxaparin group. So they, the enoxaparin, they continued for 21 days to receive Klexane. And then they were checked for DVT. So they found in the, in the placebo group, there was 12% as compared to 4.8% um, of DVT. And then after three months, um, the placebo group had 13.8% uh, 13, 13 as you can see there, as compared to the 5.5. So um, they recommended that we, we, the patients that have um, abdominal and pelvic cancer surgery should continue with, um, with Klexin for at least a month as it reduces DVT. Um, according to the Association of Surgery and Great Britain, um, and Great Britain Island, a single dose of antibiotic covering both the aerobic and the anaerobic organism should be administered just prior to um, incising the skin to reduce the rate of a wound infection. And it is also recommended as well, a second dose may be administered if, um, if there is more than 1.5 mils of blood loss and also if the procedure is more than four hours. This is um, this is to actually, because apparently it affects the tissue concentration if there is more than 1.5 mils of blood loss. Okay, sorry. So um, there was a prospective study um, done by Soboda analyzing the tissue concentration of antibiotics after a massive blood loss of 1.5. So they showed a direct correlation between um, large blood loss and a procedure of more than four hours and the greatest uh, decrease in tissue antibiotic concentration. So they concluded that an additional dose of um, an antibiotic is recommended if there's blood loss of more than 1.5 and a procedure that is more than three hours. Okay, and the perioperative component, this one is more for the anesthetist. Um, so ASCIP also recommends 80% of oxygen using face masks should be administered during anesthesia and then continued for at least six hours post-operatively. And um, the advantages of oxygen, it plays an important role in the synthesis of collagen for wound healing and, and agenesis. And it also improves uh, perfusion at the anastomotic site and reduces the risk of surgical site infection. There's also some evidence that it may also reduce post-operative nausea and vomiting. Um, the other important thing uh, intraoperatively is to prevent hypothermia, which is temperature of, le of less than 36. So this should be actively prevented using warm air blankets, and the warming should continue up until patients uh, prevent recovery, as hypothermia can lead to increased uh, incidence of surgical site infection, as this is thought to be due to peripheral vasoconstriction induced hypoxia and altered immunis um, immune response as well. And other undesirable effects of hypothermia are coagulopathy, cardiac morbidity, and uh, increased levels of circulating catecholamines with the resultant exaggerated catabolic response. And there was also another randomized control trial um, done for colorectal patients to see if pneumothermia, no, normal temperature does reduce the, um, the wound infection. So they had about 200 patients divided into hypothermia and pneumothermia as well. So the outcomes were surgical wound infection and length of stay. So the group that um, 
the pneumothemia group, there were only 6% of patients that were found to have infection after two weeks, and as compared to hypothermia, which was 19%. And also the days of hospitalization were, um, were 13.5 in the hypothermia group as compared to 11.8 in the normal temperature. So they concluded that hypothermia um, results in um, increased long hospital stay and also increased infection as well. Um, Goal-directed intraoperative fluid has been suggested in the literature um, using stroke volume as it reduces operative mortality and reduces length of stay as well. And this is important for colorectal patient as it reduces the risk of bowel hypoperfusion. But the role in gynecology surgery is less clear. Okay, and then um, the other important one is surgical approach incision. So they uh, recommend minimal access techniques. Uh, both laparoscopy and open may be used, but laparoscopy is more uh, preferable, as you all know the advantages of laparoscopy. An abdominal surgeon, if it's done, as small, it must be as small as possible to allow safe surgery. For open surgery, lower transverse incision is recommended as it is less painful and impair lung function to a lesser extent and also reduces post-operative analgesic requirement and wound dehiscency. And if it's not possible to do a lower transverse incision, um, lower or upper midline incision is also recommended. Um, according to Royal College of Obstetrics in Ghani, routine use of nasogastric tube, um, uh, vaginal packs, and ultrasound drains their role is very limited and should be avoided as they may increase morbidity and prolong hospital stay. And avoiding, avoiding the use of vaginal packs um, as they are very uncomfortable and they may actually hinder or potentially prevent mobilization. Due to the lack of evidence, um, a department approach to their use should be adopted to ensure consistency. There was a systemic review on nasogastric tube after abdominal operation. So um, they concluded that they do not accomplish its intended role, which is a prevention of pulmonary complications. So they should be abandoned. So post-operative pain uh, should be prevented proactively and uh, treated as it increases the surgical stress response and prolongs recovery. According to the Royal College, spinal, epidural, and regional, um, and regional regimens may also be used just to reduce the opioid requirements as opioids are associated with constipation and that may also, in, um, that may also hinder the mobilization as well. And they also improve patient satisfaction and are associated with a more uh, rapid return to work. So the Association of Surgeons of Great Britain and Ireland also recommend an alternative to epidural um, analgesia include transverses, abdominal plain, and other infiltrations with local anesthetics aimed at reducing post-operative opiate usage. So that's post-operative, the last component. So um, Royal College um, of Obstetrics in Ghana encourages early feeding as it is safe and associated with less nausea as well and shorten length of stay and higher patient satisfaction. There was a randomized controlled trial comparing early versus uh, post-operative feeding after major gynecological surgery. So early patients were getting feeds, uh, fluids after six hours and then, and then continue with solids if they tolerate. And then late was um, only getting feeds on day one. So they concluded that early feeding is safe and well tolerated, even though there was no difference in duration of post-operative stay and patient satisfaction and also gastrointestinal symptoms in both groups. Okay, um, so early mobilization, so this is the key to ARIS, uh, as it counteracts the negative effects of bed rest uh, muscle loss, weakness, impaired uh, pulmonary function, and tissue oxygenation, and, um, and increased risk of thromboembolism. 
So um, it is also encouraged by effective multimodal analgesia regimens that reduce the use of systemic opioids because of their side effects. Um, and then uh, regimens such as antiemetics and also laxatives may be used if patient is symptomatic, if they have nausea after operation, and also they are constipated. That will also help with uh, mobilization. Okay. So, um, as I've said at the beginning, that these are not encouraged. If they are used, they need to be removed as soon as possible as they hinder mobilization. And in addition, removing foreign bodies reduces the developing associated infection. Uh, so patients are only discharged if they are able to mobilize, if they can control pain by oral analgesia. They uh, prefer uh, paracetamol and NSAIDs if there are no contraindication as, um, as compared to opioids. But opioids can only be used if there's breakthrough pain. And also if patient is able to pass flatus and able to drink and eat, they can be discharged. And laxatives may be used until their first bowel movement as well. So in the discharge summary, it's very important to document um, the emergency contact information in case they need help, and also practical advice to aid recovery and expected length of time until they return to normal function. Um, uh, there's a discharge. Okay. So it is recommended that clinical outcomes, including readmission rates and compliance to the various error strategies, should be regularly audited. And the readmission rates after error implementation should not exceed 10%. So in conclusion, um, errors, um, multi, which is a multimodal intervention, reduce the impact of surgery uh, on metabolic and endocrine responses as um, it decreases the, lo the length of stay in hospital, which will result in earlier return to productivity, and also decreases complications as well, decreases cost to healthcare system. Gynae specific programs still lacking, um, and the multidisciplinary teams with representatives from all specialities involved in patient care are central to success of areas programs. So ERAS is the future. Another point that's coming up, because we discussed this on Monday, is I, I, I noticed the extension of, 
of thromboprophylaxis. Mm -hmm. Again, not on robust data. And, um, and so we discussed that on Monday on the obstetric side of extending thromboprophylaxis. And for those of you who want to read, there's an excellent um, editorial by Bahasa Bai and Dwight Roos in, in next month's edition of the Green Journal, Obstetrics and Gynecology. And in the same journal, they give another big consensus document which brings the whole um, move from the Royal College to really extend uh, thromboprophylaxis, not on great data. Um, and so um, Bahasa Bai and Dwight Roos are just countering it on the other side and saying it's good that we think about this, but it's expensive, it does have side effects, and a lot of it's based on colorectal cancer surgery kind of risk mm -hmm. scoring, uh, which, which I think this data comes from to an extent as well. Um, so for those of you who just want to read that about that extension that we talked about, at least go and read uh, Sabaya and Bruce's editorial in October Green Journal next month. That's two pages. And then the lengthy article is also in I saw a presentation of a French group in Paris who proposed this extraterritorial to get infections and those patients go out on the same day. So it's a huge thing. People do it all, but they, because they feel they don't enter the territorial cavity, there's no mobilization mm. or I don't think it's going to really work for all our patients with multiple previous surgery procedures, like 